Um, welcome everyone, my name is Tom Olson. I am the chairman of the ES Working Group and the Balkan Working Group. Um, this is a, the PAN, the second annual PAN 3D uh, Kronos BOF, so we're going to talk about all of the 3D APIs except WebGL, who just had their own uh, thing, which was awesome. And if we had included them, it would have been three hours instead of two. So, so I'm glad they did their own. Um, so uh, the way it's going to work, um, uh, Neil Trevitt, our, our illustrious president, is going to give an overview of how Cronus works in the 3D space. Um, we have an interesting sideline, which uh, is the data format spec uh, created by Andrew Garrard, which we just published. Uh, he's going to talk about that. He's going to set a world record by covering 19 slides in three minutes. Uh, um, then uh, Barthold uh, will give the uh, uh, status update from the OpenGL ARB working group, and I'll do the same for the uh, ES working group, both of us ably assisted by uh, some other members of the group. Um, and then hopefully that takes an hour, and then we uh, will shift gears and go into the uh, to Vulcan mode and give a report on the status of the Vulcan project. Um, so without further ado, please welcome Neil Trevitt, Kronos President, and NVIDIA Vice President. Thank you, Tom. I have to do this like super fast speed. So, but we want to just kind of give uh, the, the context and the overview before we started diving into a bunch of details. And hands up here who hasn't heard of the Kronos group before. <laughs> all right, see, I saved the whole slide. Yeah. I don't need to put that one in next time. All right, so in all of the outreach and all of the press briefings that we've been given, this is the first slide we, we always put up because I know Vulcan and Spear are nice and shiny and new, but the, the really important message is that all the traditional APIs that you all know and love, OpenGL, OpenGLES, OpenCL, are not going away. In fact, you'll see this is all the news items. I'm not going to go through them. You'll hear about them in a second. But we're, we're developing all of these APIs. They're all developing in parallel, and they're going to continue to develop in parallel uh, because they're addressing different needs. Each API is addressing different needs. Um, but it is the new generation APIs that are shiny and new. So that's been a lot of the conversation here at uh, this uh, graph. And this is kind of a, uh, an, the same slide as we put up last time. Uh, the, the three new generation APIs, the core differentiator for Vulkan is that it's cross-platform. And that's not some um, abstract con concept you know, for independent software vendors, independent hardware vendors, which is the vast majority of folks in this room, being able to have a broader reach and lower cost, I mean, that's, that's real, that's business, that, that kind of counts. And so, you know, we, we need to make sure that the open cross-platform standards are, are strong. But what does, what does cross-platform mean? Well, we're making some announcements here during the show. Um, a number of platforms are going to get Vulkan support. Microsoft is not adopting uh, Vulkan per se, but just like OpenGL, the hardware vendors are going to be shipping uh, Vulkan across uh, many different variants of uh, uh, Windows from XP up to Windows 10, and it's worth just noting in passing that you know, DX12 is only for Windows 10, so even in the Windows ecosystem, uh, cross-platform has value. But in some ways, even more fundamental are the platforms that are explicitly reaching out and uh, using Vulkan as part of their platform definition. And from the get-go, Valve uh, has been super supportive of uh, Vulkan, and hats off to them. SteamOS, they've already announced back at GDC, uh, is going to use uh, Vulkan. Here at the show, we have the Linux community beginning to come on board. Uh, so we have Canonical for Ubuntu and Red Hat, uh, both Kronos members, both supportive of Vulkan, and are coming out saying we're going to support Vulkan natively. And I think that's interesting, not just for the client side of Linux, but also for the, uh, the cloud and the server uh, part of the Linux market. We have uh, Tizen, which is a mobile OS from Samsung, so we're getting quite broad coverage. but. I think it's worth just taking a moment just to acknowledge that probably the biggest news for Vulcan coming out of this show is the fact that Android is going to be adopting Vulcan. Uh, and it's, it's kind of historic. Uh, they, they could have done a metal. We could have had perfect fragmentation, but they actually decided to do the right thing, I think not just for the industry, but for 
Android. So uh, really hats off to Google for really helping us all along. This has been an interesting show. It's been the first time we've actually had the chance to really speak to developers kind of using uh, the early, very early uh, Vulkan and DX12 uh, drivers. What is their experience of Metal too? And I've taken the extreme liberty of paraphrasing Aris's talk for the Next Generation API uh, session yesterday, the four hour session down into one slide. And that was Metal isn't quite so radical a leap because they've retained things like the object model, so it's easier to port, and it's actually a pretty good API. Vulkan and, and DX12, we kind of go all the way. We go all in uh, for explicit control. It means if you're starting with an ES app, you probably have more work to do to get to fully optimal, uh, but it's worth it because the extra uh, explicitness does give you benefit. And I went up to Aris after, after the talk and said, so is it worth it? You know, the extra effort for the return, is it worth it? And he said, yes. It is, it is worth it. And I think it's more than just being able to further optimize your applications. The power and the low level explicitness of Vulkan, we're, we're getting ready for a three layer ecosystem. So what do I mean by that? There's three different ways that developers are going to be able to tap into the power of Vulkan. Of course, any developer is welcome to optimize for the explicit low level API. A lot of the momentum behind Vulkan is from the games engine developers who are going to get excellent performance, and lots of people, of course, will use games engines. But then there's this other interesting layer in the middle, which we've yet to see how it evolves, where middleware and engines and tools and languages are going to be uh, evolving to meet all kinds of market needs and create new market opportunities that we haven't even imagined yet. And I take encouragement from that because we, we've just seen in the last boff the power of a three-layer ecosystem. WebGL, when it first came out, was considered to be way too complicated for a web standard. But in hindsight, having that low-level, powerful API gives a diversity of middleware, enables a huge market opportunity. I think we're on the verge of seeing the same kind of dynamic happen in the ecosystem with Vulkan. <laughs> Are we going fast enough? All right, OK. So ecosystem is the thing. And I'm not going to go read this, because we're going to get into more details. But in, in parallel with developing the spec, we're doing everything we can think of to develop an in-depth Vulkan ecosystem. Open source conformance tests, better documentation, uh, tools layers, open source tools that plugs into the tools layers, much more flexible Windows systems integration, and Spear V. And it's not being talked about anywhere else, so I've got permission for Tom to spend 30 seconds on Spear V. <laughs> Spear V is, in, in, I think, just as transformational as Vulkan. Um, it's the, putting a, the first cross platform cross vendor intermediate representation that natively understands compute and graphics. Uh, it's the perfect place to enable two communities to communicate and independently innovate. The hardware guys can just worry about how do I ingest and accelerate SpearV the best I possibly can. The software guys are now free to use SpearV as a back end for all manner of languages, tools, frameworks. Uh, and for developers, you don't have to ship your binaries anymore. You don't have to do the front end compiling. It's just you know, win, win, win uh, all the way around. And ecosystem, again, we're putting more details on how we're building out the Spear V ecosystem. We had the open CL off earlier uh, this afternoon. Those red boxes there are the boxes that here at SIGGRAPH, Kronos are committing to put into open source. So we have the OpenCL, C and C++ translators, the GLSL translator, assemblers, validators, which is very important for front ends, and round tripping to and from LLVM. So I think a lot of people will use both LLVM and SpearV in their tool chain. We love LLVM. And even though SpearV is not even finalized yet, a quick Google gives dozens of open source projects already using uh, Spear V. So there's now a .NET translator. So you can use C Sharp for doing your shaders if you want. There's Haskell translators. There's virtual machines, uh, debuggers, all emerging already out of the open source uh, community. This is good, good ecosystem karma. <coughs> and was, I think it's my last oh, no, two slides. <laughs> This is the same list of APIs, and I think, and I've put the possibilities in red here so we don't give all the working group chairs aneurysms <laughs> as we talk about roadmap, but there's 
super rich possibilities to begin to mix and match appropriately the different technologies that we have. For example, taking all the heterogeneous learning that we have in OpenCL2 uh, and you know, um, shared virtual memory, uh, single source programming, begin over time at the appropriate rate to start building that kind of functionality into, into Vulkan to build out the compute capability. We can take, potentially take Spear and have OpenGL ingest Spear. Why not? It, that might create a lot of interesting opportunities. And then the last thing that isn't mentioned anywhere else, but I want to mention it because it's a call for participation. We're restarting the safety critical working group, not just using OpenGL ES, but potentially using Vulkan and Spear. So I don't know how people remember OpenGL SC 1.0, done 10 years ago. Very narrow market. The avionics guys needed a safety certifiable API stack for their compass type displays. Well, that's actually been shipping, but it's obviously a niche market. But the auto avionics guys have now been joined by the automotive guys, and obviously it gets a much more uh, significant uh, shipment numbers, wanting to do electronic consoles, so there's a low-hanging fruit to bring shaders into OpenGL SC. That will be probably the first task for the Safety Critical Working Group. But looking forward, we're about to be surrounded by autonomous vehicles, robots, drones of various shapes and sizes. They're going to need lots of vision, compute, and graphics that are going to be safety certifiable. And the Safety Critical Working Group is going to be repurposing all of the technologies that we have in Kronos into that new emerging opportunity. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. Cool. Right. Uh, <laughs> So this is a specification about uh, communication. Um, so who here hasn't heard of the data format specification? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I thought that might work less well than the Kronos one. Um, so yeah, this... <laughs> don't stand on that cable. Um, <laughs> uh, this specification is uh, an extremely dull thing that's trivial that everybody has to do. Uh, I'm allowed to say that because I wrote it. Uh, I really hope this isn't the most exciting spec you hear about this afternoon, but um, it's still an important thing to have to do. So, uh, the good news is that some of you can ignore me and go to sleep for a bit, uh, for two minutes. Uh, question is, are you writing a program? Uh, if that program has to work with images and textures and that kind of thing, which I suspect will be some of you, uh, and it's stored in memory, and uh, you need that content to be described to anyone else, so if you've got uh, pixels that need to be interpreted by anyone, uh, and if you've got more than one of those things, you've probably rolled your own enums by now, um, and if you need to talk to hardware vendors or anything like that to make it work, uh, then I'll need two minutes of your time, I'm sorry. Um, so this is about formats, uh, and formats are a fairly common thing for people to worry about. You've got some bits that correspond to some data in memory, and you're doing something with them, and you want to know what they mean. Uh, and so you say, oh, they're RGB, obviously. Um, and when you said RGB, did you mean uh, that kind of RGB, or did you mean that kind of RGB, or did you mean that kind of RGB? Um, or which order were they in? Because you picked the obvious order, which could be that order, or it could be that order. Um, <laughs> and around that point, uh, I find a mouse pointer, and yeah, man. Ooh, lag. Um, and you decide that you need more than one of these things, and uh, you need to read some data from elsewhere, and at some point you get it wrong, and uh, that happens. Uh, so then you decide that you've got all the bits in the right place, and uh, hopefully it looks kind of right, so you pick some standard colors. Um, and uh, so you, you need to work out what all those channels meant, what ones are red, green, blue, you know what red, green, blue are. Uh, unless you realize that they're not quite the right red, green, blue, uh, or they're very much not the right red, green, blue, because uh, you got the gamma wrong, or you've got the wrong color space, or you're outputting to a TV, and which TV, because of course there are lots of them. Um, and then around this point, uh, you take a guess as to what it was supposed to be doing, and uh, then a colleague who's trying to do everything like this right uh, comes and does something like this. <laughs> 
Uh, so, uh, yes, an expression of the value of my work. Um, so then you decide you want to output video, and you think YUV is a good thing, and then you discover there's more than one YUV, and then uh, you decide you want to use compressed formats as well, uh, and then you decide to connect to a camera, and there are Bayer formats, and they've got some metadata, and it all gets even more complicated. Uh, and then you get it all working beautifully in your application, and you know that you're connecting it to something that works beautifully, and then you plug it all through a library in the middle, and that doesn't know anything about any of it, and it forgets all the useful information you've worked out. So, um, <laughs> generally speaking, I got to this point, and then I wrote a Kronos specification. Um, ooh, lag. At some point, we should work out a Kronos specification for making video work even faster. Yes. Um, so, uh, this ought to be easy. Nothing quite does it right, because uh, nobody really cares when they start out doing this. Uh, you do something specific to the problem space, and you knew what your problem space was, and uh, then you need to work with something that's outside that problem space, and you end up hacking it a little bit. Uh, so, you roll your own mechanism for doing this, uh, and that's fine until everybody needs to talk to each other, like, and if you're an integrator like us, we have to spend our time trying to make them work together, and not everything is as far apart as you might think it is, especially if you're trying to read the spec to work out what's happened. So, there's a data format specification. Uh, it's even newer than any other Kronos specification you've looked at. It's two weeks old. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's extremely dull. I speak from experience as a spec editor. Uh, please read this so that you don't have to do it yourself. It's descriptive. It's a block of data in memory that says this is what this format means. Uh, it's done in one true way so you don't have to read the English version. And you can write uh, code that's extensible um, and can interpret that data uh, so that it, you can handle formats that you've never even heard of when you're reading the block in. Uh, and you can extend it to add extra proprietary information as well. Uh, it's versioned, so we can screw it up the first time, and then it'll work the second time around. Um, it's flexible. Every format I could think of works in it as standard, and you can extend it to handle even weirder stuff that you couldn't possibly do normally. Uh, it's not very big. Print it out on a few pages. Go and read it on the toilet. Use soft paper, and you can use it for more than one thing. Um, <laughs> there's no conformance, unlike most of Kronos stuff. Uh, it's not tied to any other Kronos spec. It was uh, dealt with under the EGL group, but uh, we're just doing it as a donation to the community because we got bitten by this in Kronos, and we'd like everybody to not get bitten by the same problem. And best of all, there was a press release about this, and absolutely nobody in the press is a software engineer and could work out what the hell it was about. Um, <laughs> so uh, there's a link. Go and have a look at the link. I won't spoil the plot for you. Uh, thank uh, oh, yes. And by the way, uh, this is my fault for uh, using practical effects at SIGGRAPH rather than anything else. But if you, uh, to avoid you having to go through this kind of pain, uh, then yes, please look at my spec, and then hopefully I'll never have to come and kill you. Thank you. All right, that was pretty awesome, Andrew. <clears throat> All right, uh, Tom, how are you on time? Uh, just go. go quickly, Tom says. All right, uh, my name is Bartold Lichtenbeld. I'm the chair of the Open Job Working Group, and I work for NVIDIA. All right, we are uh, announcing, we did a release a couple days ago, 13 new OpenGL ARP extensions, which I bucketized in three, three buckets. We have graphics pipeline operations, texture mapping functionality, as well as new shader functionality. And if you add these numbers up, it comes actually down to 14, and that's because I counted one spec twice. All right. Um, so before we go into the new functionality, a brief update on where we are with OpenGL driver support. This, uh, this slide Christoph makes. And uh, thank you for that, Christoph. So green is NVIDIA, red is uh, AMD, blue is Intel, uh, orange is Mesa, and gray in there is, is the Mac. So you can kind of see uh, where we are with, uh, with extension uh, and full support now. Over the last year, this is kind of what happened. So AMD uh, increased the support from OpenGL 4.4 to 4.5. Mesa made a big jump, went from 3.3 to 4.1. It was really cool to see that. Intel added OpenGL 4.3 support and is making good headway in 4.4. And then NVIDIA has been supporting 4.5 since the grab last year and announced uh, support for the 13 new ex ARP extensions this week. Okay, also news here. Um, the seventh edition, yeah, well, yes, the seventh edition of the Super Bible is out. He can buy it on the show floor today. Uh, are you here somewhere, uh, Graham? Thank you to Graham. He's over there. He updated it to uh, version 4.5 and a bunch of ARP extensions. And if you can find them, there are some books available that we're going to give out as prizes for the party afterwards. But so far, the books have been missing. Hopefully, we find them soon. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, another update, uh, the GSL Slang Reference Validator is a front end to uh, the OpenGL and OpenGL ES um, shading language. It's a very strict implementation of the specification. You can run your shader through there and if it compiles, it should also compile on the actual hardware implementation you're using and vice versa. If it doesn't compile and it throws an error, your hardware implementation should also throw the same error and the asterisk is pending some um, hardware, imp hardware implementation details, uh, specific details there. Uh, it's been continuously updated. It has almost all of ES 3.1 plus AEP support and 3.2 support is coming as well as most of uh, GLS of version 4.x. Arrays of arrays are being added. Uh, Spur V translation is there now, disassembly and compression as well. And also we moved it over to GitHub and that seems to be a positive thing. We're seeing some community involvement there now. Okay. Next thing, uh, conformance testing for OpenGL. We announced for conformance suite last year and over the last year we have made continuous progress. So we've added many more tests for about OpenGL 3 and 4 functionality. So the bar is being set higher and higher for OpenGL implementations continuously and this is an ongoing thing. And then the last uh, slide here on the ecosystem news, uh, and Glue, it's been around for a long time, um, has updated already to the 13 new ARP extensions, so you can start uh, wrangling today if you want to. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about the graphics pipeline operations, the five new extensions here, and I'll go over each of those um, in, in uh, hopefully quick time. Here we go. Uh, fragment shader interlock, maybe the most important one out of the batch of 13 and the most interesting one. So it provides reliable means to read and write fragments pixel state from a fragment shader. The image here on the right on the slide came from Intel. That's where they're rendering uh, this car using a frame buffer format, some floating point frame buffer format that the hardware doesn't natively support. So they did all the blending in the fragment shader using fragment shader interlock. So why is this new extension needed? Well, a quick recap first. Uh, here I'm showing you three triangles, the red, the blue, and the magenta. And I marked uh, three fragments in these triangles, and they all overlap, and they map to the same pixel in the frame buffer. So OpenGL requires that if this is a rasterization order from left to right in the yellow arrow, that the blending, uh, the depth test, the stencil test, and the blending happens in the same order as well. Okay. Now, fragment shading, which comes right before depth, stencil, and, and blending, is a massively parallel operation, so a fragment shader will likely take these three triangles, batch them all into one batch, and operate on executes on them all in parallel, not, in, not necessarily in order. So put those two together, you get fragment shading operating in parallel on all your fragments, and then the hardware takes care of the output of the fragment shader and makes sure that the order I just talked about is being preserved, and then depth, stencil, and blending happens in the right, right order. Now the interesting thing is, if you, if you now start to actually access pixel data in your fragment shader that belongs to one of those three fragments that are overlap, that is just unsafe, in the sense that your results, if you read or write to that pixel, will be undefined, as you don't really know in what order the fragment shader is processing your three triangles there. That's why we need fragment shader interlock. So interlock guarantees pixel order of shading. And how it basically works, it would take these three, uh, three triangles, batch them up in three different batches, and each batch gets processed in order. Now that will have some amount of performance impact, but if you want to read or write to your frame buffer from doing this, then this is probably a good trade-off for you. Let's give you a, a, a practical example of how this might work. So we take the Stanford bunny, here's a G buffer, here's the normal map rendered in the G buffer of the bunnies in a normal way, and now we want to uh, apply this brick decal that I show at the bottom here of the image in blue to your normals, and then the, and the top of the image kind of shows in the shaded red where we're going to apply our brick uh, pattern to the normals in, on the, in the G buffer. Now here is where interlock comes into play. You use fragment shading interlock, you read in the G buffer your normals, you then uh, blend in the, uh, in the uh, brick pattern, renormalize your normals and write them out again to the G buffer and then the result is here shown on the, on the third image. Once you've done that, using fragment shader interlock, you can do your normal shading pass and this will be the, the end result. So you haven't actually modified your geometry and just used the, the perturbed normals in the G buffer to do this. Maybe a more, uh, more interesting example here on the left, you might have some geometry rendering them with the normal map shown and then uh, maybe this is a game, you want to show some bullet holes that were shot into this piece of geometry and you could do the same trick, you just use the normal decal map in the bottom right that has the bullet holes already encoded into it, but you need to use, use fragment shader interlock to, uh, to do this correctly. 
So what does this look like in a fragment shader? I mean, the thing to remember is you need to use begin invocation interlock and then do your, your code in there where you read and write to the frame buffer and then you end it with end invocation interlock or as simple as that. Okay, next feature. We have programmable sample positions right now. Uh, added now as an extension on the left side, you'll see an, uh, norm, an MSAA 8x pattern that's defined by the hardware. And then on the right side is where you can define, in this case, a horizontal pattern, how you want to actually like to sample um, your pixels. An interesting, uh, interesting application of this would be uh, you have 2xAA and uh, you, you, you have a pattern this way shown on the left and then in the other frame you're going to render uh, again with 2xAA a pattern on the right and if you combine those two together you get sort of a temporal 4xAA aliasing uh, for the price of 2x which is awesome. So this uh, animating GIF shows you how that might work. Okay. Next, uh, vertex shader viewport and layer output, very simple extension. It used to be that you could only output viewport index and viewport layer out of the geometry shader. Now you can also output it from the vertex shader and the tessellation shader. Okay. Next one, early fragment test and post depth coverage. So the default behavior of OpenGL is as follows, that the rasterizer produces a sample mass, it gets passed to the fragment shader, and then stencil depth and color blending happens. In OpenGL 4.2, we added the ability to do early stencil and depth testing, but the sample mass still came from the rasterizer and, added, uh, and passed to the fragment shader, which is probably not exactly what you want. So now with the uh, ARP, depth, ARP post depth coverage extension, we fixed that, where the sample mass comes actually after the stencil and depth test, so it will represent the right thing and pass to the fragment. Okay, next extension, ES 3.2 compatibility, as the ARP has always tried to make OpenGL a true superset of ES, and there's always some functionality missing in OpenGL, so we add it back with an ARP ES 3.2 compatibility extension in this case. Nothing too exciting, but it's there. Okay. I really don't touch this. Texture mapping functionality, uh, we have three new extensions in the texture mapping bucket, so I'll go over those real quick. Uh, reduction mode. So normal texturing, when you when you do a texel fetch, you filter, and the filter will probably return you the average of the around the surrounding texels as you are used to. Now you can also ask for instead to get the minimum and the maximum value of the surrounding texels to be returned to you, which can be really useful in, for example, volumetric rendering. In the top right here, this image you see normal. It's normal volume rendering where the rays are being blended and then the projection of the 2D image is shown there. But sometimes you might actually want to find the maximum and minimum value uh, in, in the volumetric rendering in the bottom right image here, which is especially useful in medical imaging. So again, on the left side, normal volumetric rendered image, but you might miss some details. So with maximum intensity projection, finding the maximum value around the array, you get all those details nicely come back to you. Okay, sparse textures. We added sparse textures in 2013, as you might remember, right? Textures can be huge, maybe bigger than your, you know, your video memory, so not all of it can be uh, resident at once. So with sparse textures solve that by making partial, uh, partial residency a, a, a possibility. However, sparse textures did have a few uh, few issues, so we fixed that with sparse texture too. In particular, if you were doing a texel fetch and the texel was filing into a piece of memory that was actually not resident, you wouldn't know. The, the uh, result was just undefined. And worse, there wasn't even a query. You couldn't even find out if that happened or not, so that was fixed with uh, version 2. And uh, version 2 also supports sparse multi-sample and multi-sample texture arrays. On top of that, we also did a sparse texture clamp function, which adds an LOD parameter to the texel fetch functions and it provides a floor of the LOD uh, that the hardware computes for you. So if you already know that the higher mid-map levels, nothing is resident, you can set that floor and you don't waste trying to fetch stuff that isn't there. So how would that, how would that work? Here's a simple uh, code example. You use the uh, resident function and you loop over it until you get a hit, basically. So to give you an, uh, a simple example, the green, green fetch here on the highest level uh, will be an immediate hit because it's resident. The two fetches, the purple one, the first, first will be missed, the second will be a hit, and then the blue one, you had two misses, and then automatically the third time is, is charm, and you, and you get your texel. If everything was properly populated, you obviously didn't have to do that, but that's typically not the case. Okay, new shader functionality, a uh, set of six here, and here's where I counted ARP ES 3.2 compatibility twice, so that's I got to 14 total. Um, we also have uh, the ability now to actually exactly get the, the uh, dialect, if you will, of ES uh, GLSL in, in OpenGL. So you just say pound version 3.2.0 ES and off you go in your, in your desktop implementation. 
Okay, uh, this is, might be interesting. We added the ability to tell the OpenUL driver, please use more than one thread to, to compile and link your, uh, your shaders and your programs. And also we added a non-blocking query so you can figure out if the link or compile is still ongoing or actually has finished. We also added 64-bit integer data types, not super exciting. We have integers and uints and uh, vector versions of that added to DLSL. Note that we already had 32-bit data types, obviously, in 64-bit floats, but this is new. 64-bit ints are new. Okay, shader ballot and broadcast adds one new function, which is listed here on the bo bottom, ballot ARB, which evaluates a Boolean across all uh, shader threads or invocations of a subgroup, if you will. And note that in a subgroup, not all shader threads or invocations might be active because uh, either you have divergent branching or early shader exits, maybe. And then the return value is put in, uh, in a bit mask. So this allows for efficient collective decisions within a group of invocations. Shader atomic account draw operations, we added those uh, in 2011, but there was very limited things you could actually do and perform on these atomic counters, so we added several more options here. You can do adds, subtracts, uh, minimum, maximum, uh, bitwise operations, etc. And then uh, this might be interesting too. Some, some ISVs were really asking for this. They wanted to get some idea of the performance of the shaders they were writing. So we added a, a simple idea as a, uh, as a clock counter that you can query. It's the only guarantee you get out of this counter that it is always increasing. You don't know what units of time they are. You don't even know if this shader will result, uh, this clock will give you the exact same value the second time you call your draw call. But uh, they can be useful to actually get some relative performance data out of the shader you're tweaking. Okay, and um, this is my last slide. So this was a thank you, uh, multi-vendor effort. So many people uh, put these spec editors uh, and leads on here on the slide here. So as you can see, through, through multi-vendor effort again. That's it. <laughs> and then Christoph is going to come up here and he has a five minute or less demo he, he promises me on what Unity is doing with OpenGL. So I don't have really a lot of time, but uh, I just would like to show you uh, our support of OpenGL um, uh, that we are working on. And uh, so for a while I've been very, very sad and I had the butterfly in my tummy. When I was opening uh, the, the, the editor, it would run with uh, Direct3D and uh, that's not uh, the good IPA. So now, as you can see, maybe on top, it's, open, it's running with OpenGL 4.5. Uh, the thing that we are rendering, it's uh, on this uh, project, it's the one we used to demo uh, our new um, Unity 5 uh, uh, release uh, at GDC. And uh, we, provide, uh, we provided the package uh, for the user just to learn from it and uh, Yes. Um, so what uh, what we are seeing it's uh, this uh, this uh, scene which uh, actually work uh, with uh, OpenGL 4.5, and uh, it's a bit heavy for this computer. But uh, so I'm going to speak about the OpenGL support in uh, uh, Unity uh, 5.3. So we are supporting a wide range of uh, OpenGL uh, version, uh, which include uh, ES and uh, desktop, but also uh, WebGL. Uh, it's a feature, par a feature parity with uh, Direct3D 11, uh, and everything is a first-class citizen. So if you write your shader with Unity, it will be directly convert. You don't have to specifically write your shader for Unity. It will just work uh, sim seamlessly. Uh, as you can see on this slide, uh, I mentioned that we support ES uh, also on the desktop, and I would like to just mention something about this because I think it's pretty important. Oh, so, why would we want OpenGL on desktop? And uh, to answer this question, I would like to point out uh, a course uh, this week, which was an open uh, problem in real-time rendering. And uh, one of the, the, the panel question was about production cost in games and what technology we need. And I think one of them, it's ES on desktop because it allows the developer to significantly reduce uh, his iteration cycle. 
So when you are a C++ programmer, to really understand the problem, it's when you compile, you don't want to recompile all your file, you just want to compile the file you just modify and run quickly. And for a developer, or an artist on Unity, it would be the same. You plug your mobile on your your, tele, uh, your mobile on your desktop, and then you need to build a player and upload it, and this is actually very long. While where, uh, when you have a, um, OpenGL uh, ES on desktop, what you can do is things like um, uh, modifying your scene, just click play, and in, instead of having a process of uh, uh, maybe 15 minutes, you reduce this, uh, this process, this iteration time to 5 seconds uh, or something. To, so that for a developer or an artist, it's a very different experience. Um, uh, yes. We are also considering some ideas, but it's still uh, not done, uh, where uh, you could just plug your uh, mobile and uh, Unity will detect uh, what's on this device and it will run exactly as if it was running on this device. So I think uh, my, uh, we are going to continue working on this. So Unity 5.3 will be uh, available in December, but uh, we have uh, alpha and beta program, and if uh, you are interested in uh, our OpenGL support, I would be happy to speak with you and include you to the alpha and beta program. And the alpha should open pretty quickly. So that was it. We well, have a quick announcement. If you were here two years ago in LA, in this convention center, and you had a popular OpenGL book, and you had that book signed by their authors, then you forgot it here two years ago. And, but we still have it, so please come talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it's basically just me, except that we're going to have a couple of guys from the ES Working Group come up later to talk about their, uh, uh, what they're doing with uh, uh, 3.2. Uh, so I'm going to cover what the you know the state of ES today. Uh, I'll give a lightning overview of 3.2, and I'll talk about the uh, the changes to the conformance program, and a little bit about the future. Um, so you know here I am in my Vulcan T-shirt, and there's lots of Vulcan T-shirts in the room, and it's it's awesome, and I'm really excited about it. It it does not do to forget because every so often I get gobsmacked to realize that, uh, you know, actually, although that future is very exciting and bright, that OpenGLES is kind of an amazing success story. Uh, up to this is Gartner Group figures 1.7 billion devices will ship in this calendar year, which puts the total number of ES platforms ever sold close to the number of people. Um, so that's sort of mind boggling. Um, a lot of it is still ES2, which for those of us who love the new features is kind of disappointing, but it is a reality of the market. Uh, still being used heavily in, uh, mostly now in really entry level uh, devices in Asia, in India, uh, but lots and lots of ES2.0 devices going into phones and tablets, uh, and the dominant uh, device in smart TVs, automotive, etc. Also finding a new niche in, I, I said ultra low power here because when I say IoT, it makes my teeth hurt, I, right? Wearables, eh. <laughs> All those marketing words. But there are these new form factors coming which require ultra, ultra low power, long live devices, and ES2 is working really well for those. New parts still coming out, new architectures coming out for ES2. Um, and of course, today at least, ES2 is, is uh, the foundation technology for WebGL defines the core feature set. And although ESSC hasn't decided what they're going to do, it's probably where they're going to start looking. Um, however, ES3 is coming along fast. These uh, thank you, Unity, for maintaining the mobile device survey. It's awesome. ES3 is up to 40% of the devices hitting the Unity survey. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. We're starting to see stuff come along. And it is the de facto standard if you're making a, uh, uh, you know, if you're taking yourself seriously as a high-end phone or tablet manufacturer, you're, you're shipping some version of ES3. Um, skipping over the, the prehistory, and so 3.0 came out in 2012 at SIGGRAPH, and after it came out, it had been a huge effort. It took us five years. After it came out, 
um, we realized, oh shit, we forgot compute shaders and we really need them. So we turned around and, and did the fastest job we could of uh, putting them in, released ES 3.1 with that. And it was ready at GDC, so we released it there. First time we've ever not released a spec at, at uh, SIGGRAPH, at least an ES spec. Um, but uh, later that same year, uh, uh, when Google announced that they were going to expose it in Android L, uh, they also introduced a large extension called the Android Extension Pack, uh, which had a lot of features in it, and they were features that, uh, uh, because Android's an important program, it turned out there was tons of hardware in flight that was going to deliver this. And we view our number one mandate before almost anything else is expose what the hardware can do. Uh, never hide hardware from the programmer. So after some discussion, uh, we decided that we needed to do an ES3 too uh, that would expose that capability. So that's what we have done. So uh, uh, running through, this is going to be short because we are short on time, um, but briefly, the goals, first and foremost, as I said, expose the hardware. AEP was defining de facto a class of hardware that needed to be uh, made visible. Uh, we allowed ourselves to add other stuff, but only if it was stuff that all of the AEP hardware in flight could do, because we didn't want to delay adoption any longer than necessary. We also had a goal that we didn't want, because Vulcan was working 24-7 and uh, secret, it's no secret guys, it's all the same people doing this work. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we got this done without delaying Vulcan, and I think we've succeeded in that. So what's AEP in a nutshell? It's a meta extension. Uh, it includes the uh, 20 extensions that you see there, plus some increases to implementation defined uh, min-max values. Um, so it's cool, but if you go to try to say, oh, I think I'd like to learn AEP, I hope, I imagine Google has awesome documentation for it. I hope so, because we don't, <laughs> right? If you go and, and read the extension, it's a text file, and it says go read these 20 text files, each of which is a handwritten delta against the specification. Now do the git merge in your head, and I hope you don't get any conflicts, because if you do, you're out of luck. Um, so that was another motivation for doing this, was to establish a clean base, resolve those conflicts, which there turned out to be some of, uh, and get a clean spec out. So uh, running through this in a nutshell, and again, no pretty pictures like Bartold had, clearly the, uh, the uh, glamorous, sexy uh, uh, feature is the pipeline extensions, uh, tessellation and geometry. Um, I was a little saddened uh, at the unsolved problems in real-time rendering course yesterday to hear Natalia say, uh, of course, using tessellation to do what I want to do with it is an unsolved problem. Um, so that's kind of sad. But there are things you can do with it, and it's in the hardware, so it is in the specification. Um, something I'm extremely excited about, uh, in ES3.1, we had the compute functionality of image read-write and atomics and stuff, but you could only use it in a compute shader. At least that's, it's only required in a compute shader. With 3.2 and AEP, it's required uh, in core that you be able to do those in the fragment shader, a uh, minimum of uh, the same number of binding points that you have in compute shader. So that's really cool. Um, per sample processing, you can do it two ways. You can get the sample mask yourself and work stuff out, or you can just say turn on sample processing and have the hardware uh, do per, per sample uh, fragment shader invocation. Um, there's extended blending operations. So draw buffers indexed gives you a lot of flexibility as far as what blending modes you use where. Uh, blend equation advanced gives you a whole bunch of new uh, blend formulas that you can that you can turn on. KHR debug. Uh, I love KHR debug. It's great to have it, and it's great to have it standard. So it's in core now. Uh, it'll be there. And a ton of texturing stuff, including uh, ASTC LDR, which uh, I'm delighted about. Cube map arrays are awesome. Um, actually, all this stuff is awesome. So that's great to have. Oh, except oh, sorry. There's one AEP feature that we did not carry over. That is uh, texture sRGB decode. Um, so the deal is that's reasonable functionality. It's, it's good to have, but it's kind of niche. And uh, after discussing it with the Android guys, uh, we didn't think that exposing the functionality this way was right for a core specification. 
Uh, the right way to do it is with texture views. We didn't actually add texture views because we didn't have time to define it. Uh, but you might infer that maybe we will. Uh, and uh, texture views is, is, we think, the core friendly, future friendly way to expose this functionality. Of course, if you're on a platform that's going to support AAP, it's going to have this extension. So you'll still have it. Uh, but we just didn't put it in the core. Then there's three things not in AEP that we also added. Uh, first of all, by long-standing request of the WebGL guys, uh, KHR robustness. So uh, this is critically important if you're going to move forward with running on trusted content. You can kind of validate ES2 content by scanning the shader carefully and by scanning the index buffer and stuff. There's no way you can do that in 3.1 when you've got, you know, it becomes the halting problem in order to determine if you're ever going to write outside a buffer. Uh, so it's really important that we have the ability to, to opt into saying, check all my memory references and do not let me access any other processes data. And don't crash me if I go outside. Um, so that's cool. Um, dry elements based vertex and other requests. This is many IHVs requesting this. It basically, from my point of view, it's a way to have to do a lot less rebinding of vertex attributes. So that's a good thing to have. And we all had support for it. So it's in. And finally, my favorite, color buffer float. Um, so I am so, I am so not going to talk about why we didn't have it before. <laughs> except to say that it's one of those tragic things that happens when 21st century technology meets 19th century patent law. Um, but anyway, we have it now. I'm not going to say anything else about it. And if you ask me questions, I'm going to stick my fingers in my ears. <laughs> so 3.2 spec came out Monday. Uh, thank you to John Leach, uh, spec editor on behalf of Kronos, and Rob Simpson from Qualcomm. Thank you also to Ben Bowman of Imagination, who did a heroic job. Uh, of uh, uh, doing the man pages and didn't even get to come to the meetings and drink beer because he's been uh, at home a lot lately. Uh, the reference compiler Bartold talked about, not quite up to 3.2, but it's got most of AEP. Uh, John was telling me he thinks he'll be done by the end of the year. And from then, the port to, to uh, 3.2 is easy because it's basically all the AEP features with different names. Conformance uh, test also not ready yet, but in progress. We have an RFQ out. Part of our, our goal of not slowing down Vulkan was we decided to completely outsource the conformance test creation. We have a lot of the tests already because of the extensions. Um, so uh, that RFQ is probably going to close in a couple of weeks. Um, something radical we're doing that we've never done before, we're going to put the conformance test into open source. And I have a little more to say about that. That's, by the way, part of the RFQ is to do the, the background work that needs to be done for that. So, uh, so first of all, why not? Well, partly laziness, partly institutional inertia. Um, but we, we are trying with Vulkan and with many things to change the way we operate to be more open. Going open source seemed like a sensible thing to do. We also saw lots of advantages to us. Um, We've been writing the tests, and we're all, you know, spec nerds and uh, and IHVs, and we are really good at writing tests for weird corner cases that your program will never hit anyway. Uh, we're not so good at finding the cases that the ISVs have been finding, where applications are doing things that are not according to the spec and it works, or they're doing things that are according to the spec and it doesn't work on some implementations. They've been finding those things, and they've been telling us, particularly Christoph's been telling us, you make it open, you make it easy, and I will put, when I hit a problem, I will put that in there. So, uh, you know, it's not that you have to do that, but we would really love it if you did. So uh, we decided to make it as easy as possible. Uh, another reason is to share code. Uh, the Android guys have been doing awesome work uh, with uh, uh, putting uh, tests into AOSP, the, uh, the DEQP test. Uh, is publicly available, open source. We could have just pulled it in, but it seemed better and more friendly to say, let's just open the whole thing and manage it together as a, as a group. Uh, we have some guys in the team who do work with Piglet. I don't, we haven't really talked about if there's anything we can do, but we certainly want to have that door open as well. So just a few issues that we have to solve. Right now, we're running it internally on a, an internal Kronos GitLab instance. Uh, for technical reasons, we're going to have to keep that, but we will 
uh, make it available through GitHub exactly how we do merges across and which is which is master and which is a, a mirror is going to be not yet settled yet, but but uh, will be settled soon. But anyway, you will interact through it through GitHub. You'll do uh, clones and and merge requests against GitHub. Uh, the reason that it's not trivial to do this is that the test has a long history. It goes back to SGI. It goes back before OpenGL ES. It's got code contributed through years by various people, most of whose companies no longer exist, under license terms that don't let us open source them. So what, what our contractor is going to have to do is their first job is factor out the old crufty stuff and uh, put that into a, a a package of tests which will have to stay closed uh, for the foreseeable future. But to get all the new stuff, which includes all the draw elements tests, all the uh, and many of the new tests that we've created, uh, will all go into the open package, which will be available through GitHub. So if you're an adopter or you're uh, or you have a license from Kronos to uh, to run the full conformance test, what you'll do is you'll put, you'll clone the open part. You'll drop the closed part into it and just say make. It'll detect that the closed stuff is there, build itself, and run the whole test. If you don't have the closed test, it'll run everything that you do have. So that's the plan. Um, it should happen before the end of the year. It's mostly a matter of getting the contractor on board and getting the work done. I'm taking too long. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to say a word about, you know, so here I am in my Vulcan t-shirt and uh, working like mad on Vulcan and loving it. Um, does that mean OpenGLES is kind of gone or its day is past and it's no longer interesting? Uh, this is my view. I haven't really checked this with the working group, at least not uh, officially and collectively, but this is what I think happens. Um, no question, uh, lots of people have been trying to write stuff in OpenGLES that just doesn't work very well because it has vicious frame rate or latency requirements or it, it needs a level of control and determinism that OpenGLES drivers just can't give you. So those apps will move to Vulkan. That's what it's for. That's why we're doing it. Um, so that's a class of apps. There's going to be another very large class of apps, maybe more in terms of numbers, uh, for which OpenGLES will still be the easiest way to get it working. If your main, you know, if your view for the application you're writing is that, man, once uh, it is functionally correct and rendering the right images, I'm almost done. You know, I, I have to do my testing and I have to do cross-platform testing, sorry about that. Uh, but I don't have to spend half of my development time trying to get the hitches out and trying to get the frame rate up. Uh, for those apps, write them in ES. It'll be faster. You'll get it done quicker. Also, ES is still going to reach the largest number of eyeballs. If you stick with 3.0, you get Android, iOS, and all the desktop. And that is the easiest way to reach a large number of people with a single code path. Uh, in the meantime, uh, so OpenGLES uh, future is not uh, we don't stop with 3.2, probably. I already mentioned texture views. There are other things that we could have added that weren't in enough hardware uh, to make it sensible or that we didn't think we could get done in time for SIGGRAPH. So I think ES2, uh, sorry, ES uh, has a significant future. I don't know when the end is. If we get something better that meets those needs, that'll be the time. Uh, or if we come up with something ourselves. Uh, but this is, this is where we are today, I think. Um, so, uh, jumping right ahead because we have so little time. I should have said, we don't really have time for Q&A because we're going to keep you longer than you wanted to be here anyway. We're all going to be here after for the party. We may have time for some Q&A and we'll, we'll try to do that. Uh, but I, I don't want to stop for that now. Uh, we have a couple of guys who have ES News who want to come forward. Piers? Hi. Uh, my name is Piers Daniel. I'm a driver engineer at NVIDIA. Um, and what I just very briefly want to say is that um, we have made available OpenGL ES 3.2 drivers um, on our website. You can see the URL right there, or just Google it, and you'll find it. Um, these drivers are supported on Windows and Linux um, from with our GeForce 400 uh, series and above. So that's our Fermi chips, our Kepler chips, and Maxwell. So this will give you a great way to start developing your ES 3.2 content now, um, so that when the mobile products come, uh, you'll be ready to deploy on those. And talking of mobile products and mobile processors, um, this is an NVIDIA Shield. And this guy will support ES 3.2 um, in an upcoming over-the-air update. And this little guy is 200 bucks. 
and you can um, just, as soon as we ship, you'll be able to test your ES 3.2 content on the Sky 2. Um, um, and our Shield tablet will support it later in the year as well. That's all. Thank you. Uh, yep, so I'm Tobias from Imagination. I'll be talking later about Vulcan. And I just realized it's embarrassing. We're all wearing Vulcan t-shirts, but I promise you we all are committed to ES32. Um, so OpenGL ES32, we're going to support on all our Series 6 XT cores onwards. Um, we've got AAP and currently shipping drivers, and we will be having ES32 available shortly. Um, I just wanted to say that you know we're going to continue to support it as long as it's needed by the industry and as long as it keeps moving forwards. But obviously, I'm going to talk about Vulcan in a minute, so don't think that we're abandoning this. There's a bunch of great new features, as Tom said. Um, Floating point rendering, yes, I love that one too. Um, and the debugging stuff, lem modes, and dynamic indexing and shaders, which is a slightly weird one, but very, very useful. And that is all I have to say on that. OK, so now we, now we move into uh, the future-looking future Vulcan mode. Um, and the way this is going to work, we, we've got yeah, uh, maybe not that much. We've got too much material, but not that much too much. OK, so the way it's going to work, I'm going to give you the very dry and boring uh, chairman's managerial view of how the project is going very, very briefly, uh, and then turn it over to working group members to talk about specific things we've done. I'm kind of assuming that, I mean, how many of you were at the new APIs session? Quite a lot. Good. I'm really glad, because we're not going to cover any of that. Uh, or at least hardly any of it. Um, also, if you've, if you've ever seen any of the stuff that we put up at GDC, which is all available for streaming, uh, we g gave quite a bit of uh, a disclosure back then in March. So we're going to kind of focus on uh, what's different and, and, and some corners of this that uh, have taken up the working group's time in recently. Uh, so we'll have uh, uh, Jens to talk about the uh, SDK and ecosystem work. Uh, Alan will talk about how you connect Vulkan to Windows systems, a surprisingly difficult problem to solve. Uh, Jesse Barker will give you a lightning tour of the major changes. So if you saw the walkthrough that Graham Sellers did at GDC, he's going to tell you everything that's changed since then. Uh, and then uh, Tobias will add some color to this by going through and cherry picking some of the high, high spots of uh, particularly cool stuff. Uh, about Vulcan. And then we have a long list of guys who are going to, it's going to go jack in the box time because we're going to have guys standing up, uh, giving a little bit of news and or showing a demo. Uh, and that should take us to beer time. So uh, the dry boring part. Uh, timeline. So uh, this project started as a, uh, a kind of a, a skunk works project with a kickoff meeting at Valve uh, back in 2014 in July. Uh, and we all said, yeah, we really want to do this. Uh, let's go ahead. At that time, AMD donated Mantle. I was going to put in the logo, but I didn't have time. Uh, but thank you, AMD, for Mantle. Uh, we started from there, and then we mutated it. And if you know Mantle, uh, you'll recognize some stuff, but it's changed a lot. Um, in August, we went public with the plan uh, at SIGGRAPH. So that was exactly a year ago in SIGGRAPH years. Um, we then kept madly working. We had basically solutions to all the major technical problems by January, kind of hit a fixed point, took a deep breath, and looked at what we had, uh, and then said, oh, that sucks. And no, it wasn't quite like that. <laughs> but uh, then we began, we moved into a refinement phase. Um, and we started consulting with some people outside the working group uh, in a casual way. At GDC, we went public with what we had. Uh, uh, both in the main conference and, and uh, at the Kronos events. Uh, at the same time, we went into relatively high gear uh, with talking to a population of developers that, that we knew who were willing to suffer with the incredibly crappy documentation and ob obtuse processes that we had uh, to get some feedback. And we got some great feedback from them. We made a number of changes to the API in response. So thank you to them for putting up with that pain. Um, we went at the end of June into a kind of freeze. Uh, it's not that we're not going to change the API anymore, but we wanted to take uh, to give the, uh, ourselves some space to get the spec written, to get an SDK built that would implement it, uh, and to start doing conformance and sort of get everything, get those caught up to where our thinking was so that we could 
then step back and take another look and, and see where we're going. So that's, that's kind of ongoing now. Um, we're still uh, making changes, but we're, uh, they're moving more and more into the margins. Uh, where we think we are, uh, we're on track to deliver a spec at the end of this year. Um, that's what we said we would do at GDC, and it looks like uh, we're on track. We're not going to be way early, but, but we should make it. Um, the critical path is turning out to be creating the spec document. We kind of know what the API is. Uh, the SDK, as you'll hear, is in pretty good shape in conformance, um, but we're all pitching in to try to make this happen. Uh, my hat's off to our heroic spec editors. They have a tough row. Uh, we're doing everything we can to support them, and we're getting contributions from guys like Jesse Barker, uh, Daniel Koch have been pitching in chapters, and that's awesome. Conformance is in particularly great shape, which is awesome. Um, it's usually the last thing we think about, and this time we're really doing it right. Uh, uh, particularly thanks to Google, who have volunteered Peter Halos, one of the world's experts on testing graphics APIs, to be the project manager. Also some uh, engineers to work on it, and we have engineers at many of the member companies. We've had code contributions from uh, Imagination, Intel, Qualcomm, Samsung. Uh, and code reviews from others, and that is fantastic. So that is, we are kind of expecting the conformance test to be ready about the time that the spec is done. And that's uh, all I'm going to say about project status. I'm going to let the guys talk about the technical uh, situation. So Courtney uh, Jens, theoretically you've got five minutes. Good luck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess I'm good to continue. Um, my name is Jens. I'm from Lunar G. And I just wanted to share with you guys a little bit about what uh, the work we've been doing. Uh, it's really been great that Valve has funded Lunergy to support the Vulcan ecosystem from the beginning. And uh, we've been privileged to, to be involved by creating the tools that will support this. And that's all meant to go out in open source. So this is stuff that's under uh, NDA today. But we're building a repo of, uh, that will go out open source the day the spec goes out. And, uh, we're, all, we're putting all this together in an SDK, and we're providing support to developers via a portal we call Lunar Exchange. And uh, you, if you want to get updates on when that is available, I encourage you to go to lunarg.com slash Vulcan, and you'll be able to uh, sign up there. Um, this is just a, a screenshot of the portal that we have running today. We have over 200 users right now within the Kronos community that are banging on the SDK, submitting issues, um, helping us improve the documentation, the validation layers, the loader and uh, the trace and replay tools that we've been developing. And so I'm going to have Courtney come up here, who's uh, been our chief architect on this project, and he's going to go into a little more detail about what's involved with these open source components and how we're putting it together. Courtney? Hi, folks. I'm Courtney Geltsnyder, and we will get started. Let's see. Press? Oh, good. All right. Uh, one of the big things that uh, when we when Vulcan got started was we were looking at the OpenGL environment and saying, gosh, you know, what are some things, now that we're doing a brand new graphics API that would make it so much better than what OpenGL provided? And one of the areas where, where um, Valve stepped forward and said, you know what, you got to be able to trace these things, right? Why do we have to bend over backwards on every single platform doing weird contortions just to figure out what calls were being made by application X running on device Y. And that inspired the idea of this loader and layer architecture. And as we explored that, uh, we also realized, well, gosh, you know, if you have this automatic binding thing with, with the API, uh, you can implement what we're calling the validation layers and, and debug layers and, you know, innumerable other things that would uh, would extend that capability if you can insert into the Vulcan calls itself. So now we can check that not only conformance checks the drivers, but the validation is intended to help an application do the right thing for Vulcan. So make the right calls, make sure all the dependencies are met, and even, you know, sometime in the future, provide performance feedback for an application to make sure that it's it's doing things in the, in the most optimal way for you know, Vulkan or maybe for a particular class of platforms, et cetera. Uh, I clicked and it didn't go. All right. 
Okay, so one of the critical features uh, and why there's validation layers, right, is the driver does not, should not, will not do checking, right? It's, it, its job is not to do the validation checking as happens all the time in OpenGL drivers, right? If you're giving it the right stuff, there's no point. Instead, you put that into this validation layer architecture and you can have it check everything and provide feedback directly back to the application about what it's doing wrong. That, and then because it's layered, when you take out the validation layers, those checks are completely gone. They have no impact on the application performance, right? And that's what Vulkan's all about. Get that performance, be able to do the checking, but when you're done with it or you don't need it anymore, it's gone completely. Some of the validation layers that exist today, I'm not going to try and read everything to you, but API dump, that prints out what the API is that you're doing. Uh, there's stuff around the draw calls, there's image op operations, memory trackers, object trackers, so tracking the lifetime of objects, making sure that you're not reusing an object before it's actually available, stuff like that. Uh, param checker, as you would expect, you know, just making sure your parameters are, are fitting within the, the um, appropriate range for the various functions. Uh, shader, spear V stuff, uh, and then uh, a threading checker, which is still being fleshed out um, to try and validate the API calls that care if they're being done simultaneously by different threads or don't care and that, that, that is being done uh, appropriately. That's going to be a really interesting area, right? OpenGL was painful with threading. This is going to be painful in a different way. <laughs> and with that, we are done with layers. So it's on to Alon. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about the most exciting bit of graphics, which is how one munges it with operating systems. Uh, be before I do that, I'm just going to have a quick word with my other hat on um, from Samsung. So uh, my, my name is Alon from Samsung Electronics. Uh, and I just want to extend Samsung's support for the Vulkan project. So Vulkan is very important for us in Samsung. We've been committed to the project from the beginning. and We're very keen to see it flourish and looking forward to it um, getting out there. Uh, we are planning to use, as Neil mentioned earlier, Samsung, Samsung is planning to use Vulkan across both Android and our Tizen platforms. Uh, we're still evaluating its use, uh, the use of Vulkan for vacuum cleaners. Uh, that, that's t TBD. Uh, but you never know, there's some very cool robotic vacuum cleaners that we make. Um, so without further ado, um, on to Windows system integration. The key goal we had with um, putting together Vulkan WSI was to have a good fit with the API. So the same model of giving apps more explicit control of what they're doing. And what we've managed to put together is one mechanism for presentation that works across multiple window systems, but without sacrificing too much. Uh, so we tried to find a sweet spot uh, between modern operating systems and uh, standardization. So I'm afraid no OS2 support planned quite yet. Um, we've got um, Android um, Windows with WDDM 1.0, Mir, Wayland, and X with DRI 3, all um, believed to work well with the extensions we've standardized. But I, I'm using the word extension because we've decided to make uh, WSI an extension to the API. So learning from experience, we want to make sure that um, whilst uh, we unify as much as possible for as many platforms as possible, we recognize that some platforms may need a customized WSI stack if what we've put together doesn't suit them. And if you have no presentation at all, uh, you may use Vulkan um, without any, any screen attached and leave that possibility open. So uh, we, we hope that we've achieved at least uh, a very clean way for your frame loops in your application to run uh, the same way across m multiple operating systems. And we hope that the vast majority of platforms um, will use this. So uh, introduction to a few key concepts in WSI. Uh, so platform is one of those words that can mean many things. For us, platform means uh, window system or operating system. Uh, and for those of you that attended um, uh, 
previous sessions or have looked at some of the material out there, uh, Vulcan has this thing called uh, VK physical device, which represents one of the devices that you have in your system. And from that, you can find out what platforms does it support. So for most cases, uh, uh, you'd only have one platform like Android or Windows, but you may have cases in Linux where there's more than one platform available and you can determine which device supports which platform for presentation. And then the physical device exposes which, which types of queues are available. Uh, so uh, in, the in, in the presentations we've had previously, we've talked about capabilities for graphics and compute. One of those capabilities is for presentation. So you make sure that the queue you have is able to, to take uh, present operations, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, the presentation engine is just an abstracted name for uh, either a compositor or a display. So the thing that will consume your, uh, your presentable images. And the key thing in, in Vulkan WSI is this thing called a swap chain. So a swap chain is an array of uh, uh, presentable images, so uh, VK images that are um, allocated by the presentation engine and are capable uh, to be submitted for presentation. So this is the text-heavy slide. Uh, this is where the argument went to and fro, uh, and that's why to, it, it was, I think, a very healthy number of iterations. So we really wanted to make sure we got the allocation model right, and we had a lot of push um, to say we want to be able to have more control of um, which buffer I'm rendering to, no last-minute surprises uh, in, in, in what buffer you're getting. So. The key thing is upfront allocation of presentable images. So uh, from your, your uh, device, you're able to create swap chains, and, and those um, are enumerated with multiple images. Now the application, the, 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 the key point is there's joint control between the application and platform as to the order of presentation. So the application can create multiple presentable images, uh, it can choose which order to present them, but it may, has to make sure they're acquired from the platform so that the compositor or the display is done using them before they're rendered to. And we've developed a very clean mechanism for platforms to tell applications if it's necessary or it's a good idea to recreate a swap chain. So if you've resized a window or if um, you've, you've got a, a, a different orientation, so it may be worth uh, recreating your swap chain. So uh, finally, um, w the key thing is about ownership. So we've, we've for, for all you EGL swap buffer fans out there, um, we've divorced the two bits. Yeah, I can see you there. You're very keen on that. Um, uh, we've divorced the two bits of swap buffers. So presenting and acquiring are two separate operations. Uh, um, it, 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 the time has come for that, um, and the, the, this diagram shows you um, the, the, kind of the order of events. So the application uh, submits these or, uh, to a queue. Again, uh, if you're familiar with some terminology in Vulkan, the, the images need to, and, and other resources need to go through transitions between different states. So you need to transition an image to be able to present it. Then you can present it to your presentation engine. So at, this, at the start, the, the image is owned by you, the application, until you've presented it to your present, presentation engine. From that point onwards, the image is owned by the uh, compositor or display. And uh, a, a little detail, there's, there's a, a Vulcan semaphore that once you acquire, request to acquire an image, it tells you the presentation engine is done with that, so that's done asynchronously, and then you, you're able to use it in the play application again. So that's WSI in short. Uh, there's there's going to be more details to come, uh, and there's also uh, one thing that Graham Sellers mentioned yesterday, um, discussion about display enumeration control, which is something that some platforms are pushing for, which we are uh, working on and would love to get more input on. So um, that's it for me. Thank you. Right. Hi.
Hi, uh, my name is Jesse Barker. I'm a software engineer at ARM. And uh, for the last year and some, it's been, uh, it's been really my pleasure to work with the rest of the Vulcan working group on, on developing, developing the spec and the standard, and also to have worked on uh, our own internal uh, prototyping efforts uh, that, that hopefully some of you saw at GDC to sort of guarantee that Vulkan uh, would treat uh, mobile GPU architectures as first class citizens. So we're, uh, we're all very happy about that. Um, so this is sort of a quick overview of the stuff we've done since GDC. Uh, it's all driven by uh, the sort of overarching principle of Vulkan, which is predictability. Um, and everything that you see here is sort of in direct support of that goal. Uh, some of this uh, is some of this stuff was left till after GDC, mostly to keep the horse in front of the cart. Um, you know, but ba basically, you see some stuff up there that's that's there to support the developer's experience with the API. Um, not necessarily huge changes, but uh, but very significant to the developer's experience with Vulkan. Uh, the remainder that you see uh, are to enable implementations to optimize resource management and uh, other internal sort of configuration -y things. Uh, and together, uh, th these all will allow the developer to focus more on their actual algorithms and less on trying to guess when the driver might actually do something kind of unexpected. Um, so in the interest of, of sort of predictable API behavior, uh, we've made uh, a few passes over the sort of you know, namespace, the types uh, of objects, functions, and parameters. Uh, and this is sort of to ensure that the developer is clear why a given object is required, uh, is a required input, or uh, to ensure that each parameter, whether it's a structure field or a direct function parameter, is, is a clear input or output, but not both. Um, and we, uh, we originally had, had memory heaps in Vulkan, and we sort of pulled them out for a while, uh, thinking that it was uh, uh, an overly complicated thing to have. And, uh, but we've sort of discovered that um, the, the constraint space uh, around sort of allowed versus required properties was a bit confusing without them and didn't always uh, express a viable choice when uh, allocating memory to back an object. And so we've, we've, we've sort of put them back in to, to hopefully simplify things a bit, at least, at least we think so. Right, uh, so to some of the, some of the sort of more uh, enhanced changes, I suppose. Um, we've, we've updated the pipeline a bit. Uh, so pipelines have become sort of pseudo-template objects. And an application can create a derivable pipeline from which any number of derivative pipelines can then be created. An implementation can then reference compatible components during derivative creation. So uh, you get uh, increased efficiency in uh, not only creating the pipelines, but also in switching between derivative pipelines uh, because the implementation has a bunch of extra information about uh, the, the differences, which, which may be very, very small in switching between them. Uh, we've also uh, added a feature uh, called pipeline caches, which um, are uh, sort of allow sharing between the components between uh, these, these derivative pipelines. And uh, the sharing ha has uh, the potential to mitigate the cost of uh, sort of a relatively large number of, of these big, you know, sort of static pipeline state objects. Uh, in terms of what can be shared, pr pretty much anything, uh, any sort of components of the pipeline, your compiled shaders, uh, your, the, the layout information uh, around your resources, and sort of any other state that the implementation might find, find useful in deriving other pipelines. Uh, this is all quite implementation dependent uh, and could be theoretically you know, any or no pipeline state. That, 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 that's kind of unlikely. The, the strong likelihood is that you know, you'll, you'll share a lot of information about compiled staters, uh, shaders and other sort of metadata around that. Um, but you know, so because of this is sort of impl implementation dependent, uh, the the benefit, the total benefit um, of the the sort of save and load uh, functionality will vary a little bit by platform, but is expected to be useful uh, across the board. And uh, this is uh, one of the features that uh, you know we we put in uh, at you know sort of at the uh, at the request of the the outside reviewers that Tom mentioned previously in his talk. Um, Right, uh, command buffer management changes. So uh, we now have uh, command pools, uh, and these serve a role in command buffer management hierarchy, sort of between the system allocator and the command buffers themselves, uh, which, which need to both be created efficiently and also to, to be grown efficiently uh, as you add commands. So this relationship is, is sort of analogous to uh, the descriptor pool, which, which we already had, and, and uh, the way that that works in descriptor set management. And, and similarly, uh, the, third, the sort of threading rule for command pools 
is that uh, no two threads can issue commands that use the same pool at the same time. So that's sort of your, your threading granularity there. Um, the pools can be created to be sort of single use or many use. Uh, in the case of many use, uh, it has, uh, has these sort of reset semantics that allow both the command buffer and the command pool to transfer ownership of resources of memory back up the hierarchy sort of on a discretionary basis. Um, this provides a lot of flexibility for implementations to provide uh, really efficient allocator behavior uh, for command constructions. Uh, th this also actually was, was one of the things that, that came in uh, from, from our, our uh, outside reviewers. Um, so we've, we've put that in. Um, we've changed the command buffers themselves. And now command buffers uh, have this sort of concept of levels. Uh, we have two of them. They're called primary and secondary. And um, applications can use sort of whichever, uh, can use more than one sort of style of, of building command buffers. You can have a flat arrangement uh, where you just build com uh, primary command buffers and put all your commands in there, and that's great, and it'll work just sort of the way that you'd expect. Um, but for maximum flexibility and efficiency of, of building command buffers, uh, applications might choose to take advantage of, of the secondary level buffers. Um, this basically lets you uh, call secondary buffers from the primary buffers. Um, there's, if you're using both levels, there's a little bit of a limitation in terms of which commands uh, can go in the primaries and which can go in the secondaries, um, but it's, it's, a, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the application uh, can th this way can sort of you know thread the construction of a render pass uh, a little better by uh, breaking the pass into sort of multiple secondary command buffers and uh, along with the primary and dispatch them all separately. Um, uh, this, uh, in addition to the sort of flexibility that this inherently provides, we also get uh, another feature out of this, um, which we've we've sort of been calling um, multi-pass uh, render passes. Though I think. This morning, or yesterday in the course, I think uh, Jesse used the term uh, merged, which I, I think I might like better, uh, <laughs> at, least, at least personally. Um, your, your mileage may vary. At any rate, uh, so we now have this concept of a subpass within, within a render pass. And a render pass is now described as a directed acyclic graph of subpasses, uh, which, which really uh, enables applications to provide even more explicit information about the layout of the render pass and, and any dependencies that exist between, uh, between sections of it. Uh, so it, it, really, it really enables the implementation to do really efficient setup and execution of render passes. Uh, by building subpasses into secondary command buffers, uh, the application can efficiently build uh, complex render passes that also execute very efficiently. And the dependency chain uh, that you provide gives the implementation enough information to guarantee that the subpass, say, n plus 1, can read the data written to the previous render target during subpass n. Um, and that, in a nutshell, is, is what multipass is. And I know you're all dying to ask, well, what can I do with that? And the answer is, I think Tobias is going to tell you. <laughs> Tobias? Sorry. Uh, so I'm Tobias. I'm here from Imagination Technologies. And I'm going to be talking to you about why we think Vulkan is great. So I'm going to cover the following topics. I'm not going to go into any, into any detail right now about them, but there's sort of an overview right there. Um, I'm also going to be presenting with a demo, uh, which is implemented in both OpenGL and ES, uh, OpenGL and Vulkan, sorry, and it's using only the core API. There's no extensions in either of these demos. The aim is mostly to highlight Vulkan's advantages over OpenGL ES, and we're doing that by applying many simple workloads. So we're not using anything like instancing or multi-draw indirect or anything like that. It's worth noting the platform I'll be demoing on is a Nexus player by Google. It's running Android 5.1 AOSP build. Um, it is a mobile class CPU and GPU, so don't expect massive performance out of it, and it will hit thermal limits, which means that now and then the uh, clock rate will throttle. Uh, this is to be expected. So if I say the frame rate's not going down and then the frame rate goes down, it's really not me, it's just the platform. <laughs> so first thing I want to talk about is how Vulkan is one API for all platforms and all architectures. Um, there is a single base API you can code against um, the core of it, and it's designed from the ground up for modern systems. So that means um, all tile-based architectures that you'll see on mobile and immediate mode renderers like you'll see on desktop typically, they're all supported from day one. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't differences between these platforms. I mean, um, you've got OpenGL 3.1 as sort of a baseline on mobile, and OpenGL 4.5 as the top end on desktop. And so there's capability flags in the API to uh, cover this, which is your typical sort of minimum maximums like you had in OpenGL and sort of uh, optional feature support as well. 
Um, and when I say optional feature, this typically means something that could be supported by everyone. No one's architecture is locked out from doing them, but they're not available on all platforms yet for whatever reason. There's also extensions, which will come in the normal flavors of vendor, multi-vendor, Chronos Ratified. And one of the new things that went out in the press release is that we've now got feature sets as well. We're only really defining the mechanism for this, um, but the idea is that feature sets will define functionality levels, um, typically defining capability flags and optional feature support to be guaranteed. Um, and while Chronos may define some of these, um, the option is also there for platform vendors to find them. Another great thing is it's an efficient API, and this is really important, especially for mobile, um, but always for any platform, really. I mean, the idea is that the GPU should not have to wait for the CPU ever. Um, you want to, we really, really want to get a, uh, the cost of the CPU out of the critical path mostly, so your rendering loop, we don't want you to be waiting on the CPU. And especially on um, system on chip platforms, so something where you've got an integrated GPU or you're on a mobile platform. The CPU and GPU will typically share thermal limits and power limits. And so if you're actually not using the CPU as much, you can usually push a bit more out of your GPU as well. So that's actually quite a nice thing. And if you're on a battery-based platform like your phone or something like with a really limited battery life like a smartwatch, you've actually got increased battery life, which again, very, very important. Um, and there's quite a lot of ways we actually do this in Vulkan. One of the really nice ones, I think, is uh, command buffer reuse. The, the idea behind this is that if you've got static content in your demo or application, you shouldn't have to need to recalculate anything. You really just want to resubmit the same work as much as possible. And in OpenGLS, this wasn't really possible. But in Vulkan, because we have this uh, command buffer, um, separation of command buffer generation and submission, you can actually bake your commands into command buffer and actually reuse them again, even after they've just been submitted. And they're not completely static. Um, you can't change any state in them, but any resources they reference, such as images or buffers, you can actually update those. So you might update a transformation matrix uh, for your camera, or um, draw indirect buffers even, which gives you quite a lot of power. And all key to all of this is that the actual cost of submitting those command buffers to the queue, the hardware queue, is actually very low. Right, so now I'm going to attempt to switch to our demo. Um, so wish me luck. This is the OpenGLS demo. As you can see right now, it's maintaining a reasonable frame rate. It's a little bit unsteady, but that's mostly just Dominic's camera work. So um, the CPU is, is sort of doing a lot of work. Um, what you can actually see is the um, platform is bouncing the main thread between two cores, which is why it's going up and down. It's sort of an average of how much work's being done. Now, if I can remember which keyboard is which. Not that one. Excellent. Oh, wait, hang on. No, it's still not that one. OK, right, I can zoom out. Now, each one of these objects you can see, each of the gnomes, each of the mushrooms, is a single draw call. Like I said, we were doing lots of very simple workloads. You can see that the CPU load has shot up and the FPS has gone right down. The GPU is, is working. It's not really working that hard right now. Um, it's just pegged by the CPU. And I can go out even further, and it's much, much worse. Um, and this is because we're doing, um, I can't remember how many draw calls it is. It's, I know how many it is involved, so we'll get there in a second. Oh, uh, I think it's about 15,000 draw calls, uh, no, 1,500 draw calls a second, something like that. So, no, sorry, 15,000, my bad. OK, so if I switch to the Vulcan demo, there we go. OK, so I've already zoomed out a little bit because I've got the keyboard switched up. However, you can see I'm zoomed out. Uh, the frame rate is still fairly high. Um, but the CPU usage is, well, it's negligible. And I can zoom out a bit further, and same sort of story. Uh, they've actually been running for a while, so they're already quite warm. So I think they should be throttled a bit. Um, but as you can see, it's quite smooth. Um, and it's running without really touching the CPU. It's, if, it's, if it's pegged, it's pegged on the, C, on the GPU, not the CPU. Right. So <laughs> another really great thing about Vulkan. <laughs> is that it's really good at outputting to HDMI. Um, <laughs> is that it's really good at parallelizing workloads. So multi -CPU, multi, uh, modern CPUs are multi-core, um, and the application, applications want to take advantage of this by using multiple threads. Um, now in OpenGL, OpenGLS, you know, it's not brilliant at threading. We've all sort of covered that. I'm not going to into detail of why, but you're typically limited to a single rendering thread and maybe a resource streaming thread. Vulkan gives you a lot more options of what you, what you can actually achieve. And there's a few things we actually um, have in the API that give you this. 
So one of the main ones is the idea of application managed threading. At least in the critical path, there's no guarantees made by the driver that calling something from multiple threads and modifying an object at the same time is going to be safe. If you try and modify an object from two threads at the same time, you'll hit a race condition. And one of the ways we've done this, uh, achieved this, is by having no global state as well. There's nothing that's um, completely global and thus requires the driver to lock in order to access it. I mean, certainly there's still system resources that will be behind the scenes, but as far as we can, we've given you the option of not touching that. And the thing I'm going to keep banging on about is the separation of command buffer generation and submission. Because we have this separation, you're able to generate command buffers on multiple threads while submitting at the end when you're done with all of them, which is very cheap. So you can do that on one thread. OK, demo time again. No, hopefully no drama this time. Dominic. OK, good, lovely. Right, so in OpenGLES, if I, oh, this probably should explain a bit about the demo first. So all the gnomes and everything else you're seeing is actually divided into tiles, and each of those tiles is a separate command buffer. Um, as a command buffer comes onto the screen, it's regenerated, at least in Vulkan. In OpenGLES, it's just some draw calls, you draw them or not. Um, because it's that situation in OpenGLES, when I start speeding the camera up and um, streaming in more gnomes, it's not going to do any better. It's just exactly the same as before. There was no static reuse of command buffers previously, and there's no threading now. So it's exactly the same as it was before. Um, now, at the moment, it's going slow. There's not much streaming happening. It's going to be doing what it was doing before, static reuse. If I speed the camera up, it's doing a heck of a lot more command buffer generation. So I th believe um, f per second to second, it's doing 400,000 draw calls total. Uh, 250,000 of which each second are statically reused, 150,000 of which are actually being generated on the CPU across those four threads. Um, as you can see, there's actually headroom to do more than that, um, but we sort of tweaked it to here and ran out of time. So, so um, one of the things we found quite important was the idea of a predictable frame, um, particularly for things like um, VR use cases, it's very important to have a predictable frame time, frame to frame. And one of the main ways we achieve this is with explicitness in the API. Queue submission, the idea of actually when you submit work to your GPU, uh, really needs to be explicit. So in Vulkan, again, we have separation of generation and submission. When you write your command buffers, there's nothing happening on the GPU. It's just going to be baking those commands down into something the GPU can then later consume. Um, and then only when you actually submit something to the queue is it going to lead to GPU execution of that work. If you look to OpenGLES or OpenGL, there's going to be some driver heuristics going on possibly. Um, if you do draw, maybe it's submitting that draw immediately to the GPU, maybe it's not, maybe it's waiting for a flush or EGR swap buffers, you don't actually know. Um, in Vulkan, the application has an explicit choice over that um, operation, which means you can have predictable results frame to frame because you know exactly when it's happening. And also, I shouldn't wave my hand in front of Dominic's <laughs> camera. <laughs> my bad. Another thing that's very explicit um, is resource management. So the idea is that from start to finish, you tell the resource exactly when to create, be created and when to stop being created. And when it's ready, it's ready. There's no more of um, pre-warming assets or the idea of deferring data uploads until draw time or shader generation. The, all these resources are ready when the application decides. Resources are also sort of bring your own memory. Um, you create an image or a read buffer, and then you ask how much and what type of memory you actually require for it. And then there's um, heaps and memory types that give you the information you need to actually make that decision about where you want to put this memory and how you want to allocate it. And obviously, you also know exactly how much you're allocating, which is something you do not have in OpenGLES. The actual mapping of those uh, memory objects to allocations is con entirely under user control. So this leads to some interesting schemes you can do which you couldn't do in OpenGLS, such as um, let's say you've got two transient um, frame buffer attachments, and they att they're both accessed at different points. So say you've got five render passes. The first one uses uh, something to do some temporary data into it, and the last one uses it for some temporary data, like depth buffer perhaps. Um, you can actually use the same memory backing for both of those objects without really worrying too much about it, even though they could be um, different formats or different uses. And there's actually sparse features in the API which should give you even more control over this. And finally, what I think is probably the most important, certainly from our point of view, is that it's designed for all architectures. It's what I like to say, uh, what I'm calling architecture positive. The idea is that it's 
emphasizing all architecture's strengths rather than trying to just put features in because we can kind of do it and then worrying about whether it's actually fast later. It has to work and it has to work well as we put it in. Uh, a good uh, example of this is the render passes. Now, GDC, we said they made render targets and loads and stores uh, explicit, um, which was great news for Tyler's. We didn't have that before. And as Jesse just alluded to, we have uh, sub-passes now, which allows you to chain multiple passes together and they can communicate via pixel local data. This actually means we have pixel local storage in the core API. Um, and what that means, for those of you who aren't familiar with the extension, is that for tiled architectures, we can actually keep data on chip between render passes uh, without consuming any external bandwidth or, in fact, making allocations for these render targets to begin with, uh, while still allowing um, immediate mode renderers to actually allocate the resources and use what they need to do. Last demo, hopefully. <laughs> well, for me, at the moment, we've zoomed back in just to let OpenGLES cool down for a minute. Um, and I'm going to add some render passes. So the first one, we've got a sort of sim, uh, color grading effect. And we're using RGBA 16F uh, render targets for this, the HDR render targets. And then I'm going to add a second one, just for fun. And we've added a bit of a vignetting effect. Uh, it may not be coming out quite as well, but you can come see it afterwards if you're interested. And the fact is, we're using about 63 megabytes per second of bandwidth, uh, sorry, per frame of bandwidth to read and write these render targets. And that's a lot, particularly on mobile. And it's also uh, allocating about 31 megabytes of memory to um, store these surfaces in. And that's because we're using the core API. Of course, I could use pixel local storage to get around this, but as I said before, we're using the core API here. Now, in Vulkan, the story is a little different. Because we have these render pass objects, I can add my effects, and it should have no noticeable effect on the frame rate unless it decides to throttle. Yep, good, excellent. And the idea is we're only doing extra compute work that actually do the effect, but we're not actually consuming the additional bandwidth, and there's no allocation for these surfaces. They're entirely transient. Um, if you want to know more about that, um, feel free to come talk to me afterwards. And just to prove the point, as everything turned on and going really fast with all of the render targets. And um, just to really prove the point, <laughs> there's the OpenGLES one, and it is really, really struggling. It does not like that whatsoever. Vulkan gives us a lot of control at a much greater efficiency than the previous APIs have given. Um, and it's one API for all architectures, all platforms, and it gives a lot of advantages. Um, I invite you to come see the demo afterwards. I'll be over there in the demo, demo area answering questions if you have any. Um, there's more information on the Chronos site. Um, on our Imaginations blog, there is actually a description of the demo, or you can contact me on Twitter, and do not ask me questions now because we're running out of time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So while, uh, while Jesse is setting up, we're moving into the, the last phase, you'll be glad to know, of the buff. We have a number of short statements from members, uh, including a number of demos, which is, means we're going to be in device swapping hell. And in order to minimize that, Jesse's going to do his slides from his own machine instead of mine and, and his demo. Uh, but anyway, take it away. Cool. This one actually worked. Um, so. I will be really quick since we're running late. Um, so as most of you probably heard by now, uh, multiple times, um, Android is going to be using Vulkan. We're going to be adding it to the platform. Um, we think that it is a pretty good mobile API. We're pretty happy with it. Um, and I'm going to mostly just skip this because it's redundant with what other people have said. Um, and I want to get us done. So basically, it's awesome. We like it. Uh, we're going to be supporting it in a future Android release. Um, so as, as an application, if you uh, target a particular version of the platform, you know that the loader will be there. Even if you know, the device has an older GPU that can't support Vulkan, you at least have the basic support there to ask, what, what can this device do? Um, you'll be able to uh, declare in your application that you require Vulkan if, if you do, um, and the, you know, the Play Store won't try to deliver you to devices that don't support it. Um, and we're going to be you know, including the shader compiler and validation layers and a bunch of other tools uh, in the NDK so that w when you get the NDK, you have everything you need to start doing Vulkan work. Um, as Tom mentioned, we are contributing pretty heavily to the uh, test suite. Uh, we think this is uh, vital to making a successful API, and we're, we're pretty committed to seeing um, a, a 
com a, an exhaustive test, well, <laughs> exhaustive is a strong word, as, as strong a test suite as we can possibly make. Um, and we will be enforcing it on all Android devices and, and updates to them uh, that support Vulkan. Um, and finally, uh, I want to kind of reiterate what Tom said. Uh, OpenGL yes is still the right answer for some applications for, for a variety of reasons, the ones he said. Uh, if you heard RS talk uh, yesterday, um, he explained why moving may be difficult for some people and might not be the right way to spend your time, uh, in the short term at least. Um, so we will be uh, continuing to support OpenGLIS, of course. We're contributing to it. Um, and if there's things that it makes sense for us to do as a platform to, to move that forward, uh, if that'll help developers, we'll do that. So um, I'm going to do a very quick set of demos. Um, and the main point of these is uh, we have the same code running on multiple Android devices from multiple vendors. Um, so. We're pretty happy about that. We got a lot of support from Imagination, NVIDIA, and Qualcomm um, to port one of our OpenGLES you know, NDK samples uh, in a very short amount of time. It doesn't do a lot with Vulkan. Um, it does use reuse command buffers, and it uses some of the dynamic uh, uniform update stuff in a much more efficient way than it was able to do in OpenGLES. All right, so this is a whole bunch of uh, teapots with well, it will be a physically based shader uh, with a bunch of varying varying parameters, and that one is running on an NVIDIA Shield. Um, so if we can switch, a really <laughs> truly <laughs> truly magical presentation. Uh, <laughs> this is running on a Nexus 6 with a Qualcomm GPU. <laughs> All right, and I think that's enough of that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Uh, please welcome Dan Ginsberg from Valve. All right, uh, I know I'm standing between you and your beer, so I'm going to talk really fast. Um, thank you for inviting us to speak at the Birds of a Feather. Um, my name is Dan Ginsberg. I've been working uh, for Valve on Vulcan since its inception. And uh, since hosting the first Vulcan face-to-face -face meeting last year, uh, we've been really pleased with the progress of the API, and we think it's the right way forward for powering the next generation of high-performance games. Um, I wanted to tell you briefly about a little bit of work we're doing uh, with Vulkan at Valve. Personally, I've been working on porting, Vulcan's, uh, porting Valve's new engine called Source 2 to Vulkan. Uh, the engine has already shipped to customers with the release of Dota 2 Reborn. You can download it now off of uh, Steam Beta. The Vulkan version isn't there yet, but we have seeded it to all of the desktop IHVs. And one thing that is very exciting is that uh, they all have it running on their drivers. Um, and to us, that's really a, a, a validation of a key uh, design goal of Vulkan, which was by reducing the surface area of the API, uh, drivers are much simpler and they've been coming up much faster and we're just really happy with the, the progress of uh, how all of the IHVs have drivers running. Um, Intel is showing it running on their driver at their booth on the show floor if you're interested in seeing it. Uh, as Jens mentioned earlier, we're also uh, very involved with Lunergy in creating an SDK. We think it's super important uh, to have a world-class SDK to make Vulkan accessible to developers and to that end. Uh, Lunergy has been doing great work on uh, all the tools that they talked about, which you've already heard about, so I will skip. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is, is just give our view of why Vul we think Vulkan is the future. Um, Unless you're aggressive enough to be shipping a DX12 game uh, this year, I would argue that uh, there's really not much reason to ever create a DX12 backend for your game. And the reason for that is that uh, Vulkan will cover you on, on Windows 10 on the same class of hardware and so much more from all of these other uh, platforms and uh, IHVs that we've heard from. Uh, Metal, it's a it's, uh, single platform, uh, single vendor. And Vulkan, we, we're going to have support on not just Windows 10, but Windows 7, Windows 8. Uh, we're going to have it on Android. And all of the IHVs are making great progress on drivers. Uh, I think we're going to see super rapid adoption. And so, you know, if you're developing a game for next ger generation APIs, uh, I think it's clear that Vulkan is uh, the best choice. And um, we're very pleased with, with the progress and the state of the API today. Uh, we think it's going to power the next generation of games for years to come. So thanks for having us. So uh, please welcome Zoltan Hortzen from uh, uh, Kishanti Informatics. So 
So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Zoltan Harchim from Kish Home T. I'm the um, chief rendering engineer of Kish Home T for seven years. Kish Home T is a team of experts engaged in graphics and compute benchmarking for uh, more than a decade now. GFX Bench 5 is our latest GFX benchmark iteration aimed uh, at recent uh, low level APIs. GFX Bench 5 is the first to work on benchmark and has an entirely new rendering engine. It is built on an in house render API to cover the following high level and low level APIs Workon, Metal, DX12, OpenGL Desktop, OpenGL ES, and DX11. Uh, this render API also has a basic shader translator, so we can use the same shaders on each platform. Uh, the focus of GFX Bench 5 is on, on low-level APIs. High-level API support is mainly for comparison and development. Um, the GFX Bench 5 working title is Alien Beam, and the theme is a night scene uh, with alien spaceship causing a tornado light effect. We chose this to showcase uh, lots of uh, individual draw calls. Uh, the efficiency uh, of compute and rendering interoperation allow us to demonstrate on the fly generated light source. <sighs> so the, <coughs> the current state of GFX M5 is work in progress and in beta state and supports the night, version 90 of Vulcan. We are moving to uh, version 138 uh, very soon, and Android support will be uh, available soon. The ATA, is uh, the ATA is beginning of September, and the release candidate version is expected uh, end of this year. So now let's show the video. So here is the video. You can see a lot of light box here. Uh, which are animated by compute shader and they are also light sources. And you can see the tornado effect here with the, uh, a lot of draw calls. So uh, I would like to summarize the most important features of the rendering pipeline. Uh, it uses deferred rendering, uh, but switches to forward rendering at the transparent object. Uh, it is uh, a HDR rendering and using adaptive tone mapping. The lighting model is physically based lighting. Uh, another feature is light shaft, which is based on a ray, ray marching algorithm, and the uh, particle systems are compute based. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, the rendering pipeline in details. Uh, we have uh, three passes. The, in the first pass, uh, we use a compute based, uh, we animate uh, the particle systems by compute shader. It, just not, uh, it is not just a single emission and abduction shader, it also generates point light, uh, which will be used in the shading pass. And uh, we, ran, we generate geometry for rendering. The second uh, pass is a classic deferred rendering pass. We render to GBuffer using MRT, and we issue a lot of draw calls here. <coughs> we also do uh, the shading pass here, and uh, we using point light, spot light, and uh, directional light. The lights come not from only the scenery, scenery but they are ended in the previously mentioned compute pass. Uh, the third pass is a, a, a fourth bar rendering where uh, particles systems uh, light shafts and uh, uh, beam effect uh, rendered. And in the last step, the, we have the post-process effect, which uses uh, compute shaders uh, to calculate uh, average luminance. And, uh, uh, and after uh, all the things, uh, the final composition happens. And so this, these, are, uh, these are our future development plans. 
Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are moving to the new version of Vulkan, and we will add Android support, and we would like to uh, include more rendering features like dynamic shadows, image-based lighting, and enhanced fog algorithm, and we would like to include more additional post-process uh, effects like velocity-based motion blur, dust of field, SSAO lens flares, and uh, on the long term, we are looking into ways of exploiting the multi-threading capabilities of Vulkan, maybe, and we are uh, thinking of stereo rendering. So thank you for your attention. Hello, I'm Maurice Ribble. I work at uh, Qualcomm, and I've got a really short presentation considering we're running behind. Um, OK, so basically I wanted to tell you, well, more things than I'm going to tell you. But uh, to keep things short, I will uh, just sort of let everyone know that uh, the Snapdragon 820 was announced uh, this morning by Qualcomm, which is a really cool uh, new SoC from Qualcomm. And uh, I think the reason I wanted to bring it up today is because it has a lot of features that are really going to be optimized um, for Vulkan and, and really bring out the best in Vulkan. We, we heard about multipass and that uh, GPU there, which is the Adreno 500 family. It's the first SoC we're releasing with the Adreno 500 uh, level GPU uh, will be better supported there. Uh, we are also going to have some changes to how descriptor sets work, which will uh, make our uh, GPUs have less draw overhead there. However, Vulkan does also work great on existing products. Uh, we'll be showing a demo after the presentations here on uh, the Snapdragon 810, which has an Adreno 430 in it. And I think we're good to show the demo at this point. All right, hi, my name is Piers Daniel again. Um, I'm working in the Vulcan driver team. I uh, work for NVIDIA. Uh, just real briefly, a lot of this is uh, people have said already, but NVIDIA, um, Vulcan is very, very important to NVIDIA. Uh, we think it's a great API. The most important thing for us is it's, a very, it's an open API. Anybody can contribute. There's no single platform um, owner that defines the API or controls the API. It's, it can, it's controlled by all of us, and we can contribute to it. And when we launch a new GPU, for example, um, we can launch extensions for that uh, new GPU without getting permission from anybody. It's, it's an open API. Um, it can be used on any of our platforms, and it's very, very fast. Um, we are currently developing a driver. Uh, anybody who's a Kronos member or a Kronos um, Vulkan advisor um, can get our driver if they sign an NDA with us. Um, and our goal is that when the specification is released later this year, um, that we'll make a driver public. Um, that will be for Windows and Linux and shortly after for our Shield um, Android platforms as well. Um, now I'm going to show just a couple of the, the uh, benefits of uh, Vulkan. Um, the, I'm going to do this uh, on my laptop here. So this is a, um, a CAD application. Um, and what's the cool thing about this is there's 11,000 draw calls happening to draw this, uh, this scene. Uh, and in between each draw call, there are two state changes. Um, and right now, this is running in OpenGL mode. Uh, one of the great things about um, Vulkan Driver on our platforms is that um, it's hosted by the OpenGL driver, which means you can do OpenGL and Vulkan um, from exactly the same app simultaneously. So the UI you see in the top left corner, that's all rendered by OpenGL. And right now, the, this GPU, is um, this, this graphics card, is actually rendered by um, GL right now. And if you look at the top left corner, um, of, the dis, uh, of this window, you'll see that we're using about five milliseconds of, of CPU time to render this. Now, if we switch over to Vulkan mode, you'll see that um, CPU time dropped down to just like 1.4 uh, milliseconds per frame. Um, so that's a, like a 5x savings almost in CPU performance. All right, so that's 11,000 draw calls per second. Now we're going to get crazy. And we're going to load a ginormous model. This model takes 2.8 gigabytes of memory. Um, so it takes a little while to load. Um, and it's 220,000 draw calls per frame. Um, and then we're going to see uh, where Vulkan can really shine uh, in terms of CPU usage. So hopefully this loads. Like I said, it's a ginormous model. 
here's the model, and you, see, you can see that it's a little bit sluggish in GL. Um, and we're using about, okay, there we go, that's more like it. All uh, right, so you can see this, this model is taking about 43 milliseconds uh, per frame to draw all of this. Now we're gonna drop down to uh, Vulcan mode. This is single-threaded Vulcan mode. Um, and it's reloading the entire model into Vulcan, so that it takes a little while to switch over. And you can see we went from 38 milliseconds per frame down to six milliseconds per frame, which is a really good saving. Now, the other thing that really makes Vulcan stand out um, to OpenGL, this is something that OpenGL cannot do. Even if you write your app extremely well, you cannot do this with um, OpenGL, and that is um, scale well across multiple threads. So now I'm gonna increase the, the number of threads to two, and we're gonna watch the CPU time go down even more. So now we're using two threads to submit all the work and our CPU dro drops down from 6 milliseconds per frame down to 3.7 milliseconds per frame. Um, and that's something that is unique to Vulkan. All right, let's switch back to the slides. Um, so we have exactly the same ginormous model also working on our Shield Android platform. Um, this is using one of our software frameworks where you can write the same code and you can deploy it on multiple platforms and we'll make this available as well. Um, so the same code is going to be running on, uh, on Android, so let's switch over to that. All right. All right, so this is our Shield playing um, Android TV right now and we have a little uh, Vulkan prototype app which I will start right now. Um, and this is the GPU model I was showing earlier. Exactly the same stuff, same code, running perfectly smoothly on um, our little Tegra X1 chip. This is running at 60 frames per second, 11,000 draw calls per frame. Uh, and I'm gonna switch to something a little bit more challenging. Um, this model is only half of the model I showed earlier because 2.8 uh, 2 gigabytes is just way too much. Um, so this one is 110,000 draw calls per frame, two state changes per draw call, um, and here we are running at about 23 frames per second. Same code running on Windows and Android mobile and desktop. All right, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, my name is Sovi Grejski. I'm, I work for Intel, and I'd like to show you the demo that uh, presents the benefits that you can experience when going from OpenGL into, um, into a Vulkan. This is a simple application that uh, demonstrates the benefits. It renders uh, 2 million points using 200,000 draw calls per, C, per frame. This is not something that you would usually do, but this is to uh, expose the driver overhead. On the left side, we can see the CPU power consumption and frames per second. They are repeated on the lower end, lower end on the left side. Then on the right side, we can see the load of the cores. In OpenGL, the application is running in the same thread as driver. So we, in this case, we are bound by the um, core zero. The other cores are more or less idle. When we switch over the application into Vulkan mode, oops. what's uh, interesting to observe is that uh, frames per second increased significantly. Uh, the power consumption decreased uh, noticeably. And because uh, Vulkan API is multi-threaded, we uh, generate the workloads in multiple cores, and we should see that uh, <clears throat> even though the, the workload is spread across the cores, we can see that the CPU power consumption is, is low. This uh, <clears throat> benchmark can be run also in locked mode where we have the same uh, amount of frames per second regardless of the API. And this is to show that uh, in Vulkan we have some amount of CPU power consumption. And when switching to the OpenGL mode, we can see that frames per second remains the same, whereas the um, CPU power consumption increased uh, significantly. On the right side, of course, we can observe the relevant uh, load on the cores, which uh, in OpenGL we are on core zero, in, in Vulkan we are spread across the cores. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.